Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Jimmy Whitaker. We're just going to get started with a with a couple of introductions. Um, so I'll I'll go ahead. So um, I'm a machine learning developer and developer advocate at Pachyderm, where we're trying to solve some of the hardest data logistics problems in machine learning. Um, prior to joining Pachyderm, I actually led applied research teams that were building NLP and speech recognition models for some of the the top financial institutions in the world, and I also co-authored a textbook on the topic discussing deep learning approaches for NLP and speech recognition. Um, yeah, Bruce, do you wanna, you wanna take over and uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Thank you. I'm Bruce Jacobs. I'm the Solutions Engineering Lead for North America for Selden. Uh, prior to joining Selden, I was the Vice President of DevOps for three years for a FinTech. And then prior to, after that, I was uh, Manager of DevOps for a nationwide insurance carrier. And uh, both, both of those positions, we. We definitely felt the pain of deploying machine learning models into production. Great. Thank you, Thank you Bruce. All right. So <clears throat> for the agenda today, we'll be talking about how Pachyderm and Selden solve many of the challenges in machine learning development and deployment. So we'll first start with a brief overview of each of the products, just so you have some context going forward. Then we'll discuss some of the technical challenges that exist for machine learning in the fintech realm to set the stage for the demonstration we'll do later on. Then we're gonna introduce that demo that we'll be working through today, which is a market sentiment analysis model. And then finally, we're gonna walk through the demo. Uh, and then after that, we'll open up for some Q and A at the end. So um, yeah, we'll start with, a. will give a brief overview of Pachyderm. So what is Pachyderm? So Pachyderm is a very powerful data versioning and processing platform that provides the foundation for data in machine learning and data science development. It can be used to automate many components inside the machine learning lifecycle, as we'll see today, from the data ingestion to the model deployment side, or development and deployment side. And it does this by maintaining two components. We have the data versioning side, so a data versioned file or a versioned file system. And we can also connect this version file system with code pipelines that are written in any language. And this actually gives us end-to-end -end reproducibility for any data set, any model, any code pipeline attached to any of these data sets or models or any other artifact in the system. So it's really powerful. And in today's demo, we're actually mainly going to be focusing on, pa uh, on Pachyderm for our data management, automating our data set construction, and our model training environment. And Bruce, do you want to tell us a little bit about Selden? second. So Selden solves the last mile for data science problem. We make machine learning easy to deploy, manage, and understand. Selden's deploy is built upon two of our open core products, Selden Alibi and Selden Core. Selden Alibi enables black box model explainers, outlier detection, concept drift, and then <coughs> Selden Core is our prepackaged model servers, which I'll show during the demonstration, our custom language wrappers, which I'll also show during the demonstration, and we manage the deployment and serving. And we take all of that, and we wrap it in a self-service UI. It's enterprise ready, and it has pre-built integrations for everything you see on the right-hand side from Prometheus to Elastic to Istio, et cetera. And we wrap all of that in an API and an SDK, and we support that with 24 by seven SLA support. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Bruce. So, in fintech, there are many challenges in the space to incorporate machine learning based systems, but many of these can be described really as the research to production gap. So we're constantly seeing the hype generated by research models that can show the amazing capabilities of AI, but they often misrepresent the ability to do these things in the real world. For instance, in my case, in my background, uh, of speech recognition, my transformer architecture that I've created may have the capability to learn a variety of accents and languages, but my model's ability to actually do so is very much dependent on how it was trained and the data that it's learning from. So the difference between the capability and the ability is moving it from research into production. And in research, the main difficulty is that things are frozen. Uh, people have a, a single data set that they're working with that they're iterating on to try to create new uh, new learnings or models that are doing better than previous models. But in industry, this is really difficult. Things are always moving. And we constantly see the discrepancy, most notably between the development process and the deployment process for research versus uh, versus industry. So I would say that once, 
personally, I would say that once we develop, uh, or sorry, deploy our model into production, that's actually where true development begins. This is the first time that our model is actually seeing real world data. And it's in a context where the data is always changing and growing. We begin to see the bias presented in our training environment. And we're constantly trying to incorporate new techniques and technologies to improve our models without getting caught in the quagmire of the reproducibility crisis. Furthermore, I would say deploying once isn't enough. I think we've all learned this in the case of software development. We need to be able to iterate and incorporate our new understandings into our learning algorithms. And this means that our deployments must be reliable, scalable, and give us useful insights about how our model's performing in the real world. So how do we bridge this gap? How do we begin turning this capability of AI into an ability? And the answer really is we need to move data to the center of our workflow and use tooling that enables this because data is actually how we turn our AI capability into ability. Let's go to the next slide. And this is also an iterative process. So in the case of data, for machine learning systems to get better, we need to make sure that we're feeding them good data and evaluating them against real data in the real world. So if our data is wrong, then our model is gonna learn the wrong insights about the world around it. It takes time to apply our human expertise and understanding to the world of individual data points too. So for instance, in this example, the seemingly simple task to draw bounding boxes around the animals in the picture is actually an ambiguous prompt, even though it seems very simple to begin with. And this can have multiple interpretations as we see in these three pictures here, that even experts would disagree with on which one is correct, just depending on the context and what type of model is being trained. Even furthermore, in the speech recognition world, uh, I remember struggling to decide whether we should incorporate the ums and uhs and filler words into our transcripts as our models were transcribing audio. They do, like this decision does convey the real world. However, it hinders the readability of the transcripts and can also have implications on the downstream NLP models. So essentially, every label <clears throat> or every uh, conver conversation piece that we have or every uh, uh, label or transcript that we apply captures our understanding at the time of labeling. Every action is a product of the data points that we personally have seen before, but the more that we see, the more that we understand the landscape. And that's kind of the key component that we want to talk about in some of machine learning ops and how we handle this today is how we handle our data. So in order for our data sets to be reliable and trustworthy, we to actually do this in, in the real world, we have to version them, we have to iterate on them, and we also have to evaluate the effects of our changes on our model's predictions. And the point is really that AI is directly dependent on both the code that we write and the data that we, that we curate. So rather than a single development life cycle, we actually have two things happening at the same time with dependencies on each other. This is a graphic I put together to tr try to describe the, the two loops that actually are crucial in machine learning. We have the code that is written that is going to train, test, and deploy our software. And then we have the data that our model learns from, is tested by, and then sees in production. And these two loops must come together to consistently produce models that reflect the changes that we see in the real world. We need tooling to manage this as well. Like just like we have Git ops and, uh, and Git to manage our code, we need tooling to manage the data development process and production systems to monitor how those models are performing to, to gain reliable insights on them. Now, I've made the problem potentially sound worse than you might have thought before, but we're actually going to be showing you an incarnation of this diagram in our demo today and what it's going to be like to actually walk through this in a real world scenario. So we're going to walk through how we use Pachyderm and Selden to center your development and deployment process for successful iterations to turn AI capabilities into reality, while also saving you time, money, and the headache of trying to track all the complexities in this process. So specifically, today's demo, we're actually gonna be talking about an NLP model to predict market sentiment. The purpose of a sentiment classifier is to take a string of text and to classify it according to the emotional attitude that it expresses. For instance, in the case of market sentiment, we can think of it as this is a positive or negative or neutral outlook on what's actually being represented. Market sentiment models can actually be tremendously useful <clears throat> when looking at a stock or even the market as a whole. The emotion surrounding uh, a particular stock or the market can be contrary to the fundamentals and be an early indicator of many opportunities of risk 
or, uh, or even just opportunities for taking advantage of a situation, um, as we see with the fear index and other types of things built off of this type of technology. And more generally, it even serves as an example for any general NLP workflow in the real world. So we've used these types of things for different types of classification problems or even entity recognition and those kinds of things. Can we go to the next slide? So more specifically, uh, we are actually gonna use the FIMBERT technology that, uh, which is a technique developed by the process team. Uh, so definitely a shout out to them. I think they may be on this call today. Uh, that relies on transfer learning to produce a state-of-the-art deep learning model for market sentiment. So the FIMBERT model is created by <clears throat> initially training a financial language model on a large unlabeled corpus of financial data. This allows the model to learn what words are commonly seen together and get a general understanding of what certain words may mean in a financial context. The model is then trained and tuned on a smaller labeled financial sentiment data set because labeled data is always more expensive together. And this allows the model to have learned a robust general understanding of financial language and then apply those learnings to a specific domain. The next slide, please. Lastly, what we're gonna do is we're gonna incorporate a feedback loop into our development process. This way we can monitor requests coming in and as more data becomes available, we can label it and then iterate to improve our model by adding production data to our development. And just as importantly, we're actually gonna version everything in the process to ensure that we can recover anything that we've done and go back in time if anything was done incorrectly. This is especially important in the FinTech world, at least in my experience, where data is A, constantly changing, but B, regulatory pressures on models to be explainable or compliant are a very real concern. And the pressures from upper management to streamline processes and make things more efficient make that even more difficult when you're trying to track everything that's happened in the process. So when we put everything together, the overall flow is gonna look like this. We're gonna have our data curation, model development and tracking of our data all happening in the Pachyderm world. And then when we deploy our model to production, we're gonna be using Selden. We're then gonna pull data from the production environment back into Pachyderm's version file system we're going to label that, and then we're going to iterate to improve our model. And a lot of these things will be automated, which are gonna be really exciting. So, so I, I think that's it for now. We'll keep referencing this diagram, uh, but I think we're ready to move on to the demo. All right. I think my screen is sharing. So for the purposes of this demo, uh, I'm actually gonna be using Pachyderm Hub, which is our hosted version of Pachyderm. It makes it seamless to get started using Pachyderm without having to deal with the complexities of Kubernetes. And you can also create a, four, a free four hour cluster to try out all the code that you've seen in the demo today. What I actually have opened here is the Pachyderm dashboard. So I'm gonna use this to monitor the commands and explore the data and the pipelines that we create. Um, we're actually really excited about a new version of Dashboard going, coming out really soon, so definitely stay tuned for that. So for running these commands, the, I'm actually going to be using uh, the command line utility. So pack control is what it is. So you'll see my terminal over here on the right. And uh, we're going to be monitoring them over here inside of uh, the Pachyderm Dashboard. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create a data repository to hold our sentiment data set. And we're going to call this Financial Phrase Bank, which is the name of the uh, sentiment data set that we'll be using for this, for this project. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a file uh, to this data set. And so we're gonna use the pack control put file method, and then I'm gonna specify, I want this repository, and then a little bit stretched off the screen, uh, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna use the, the master uh, branch for that data set. And then I'm telling it the file name and the file location that it is locally. So running this, it's going to upload my file. Apologies about the, <laughs> the, the resizing there. And once this file is uploaded, then I can actually click into the data repository and see that my file is present. Uh, one more thing I'm going to note is that this sentence is 50 agree. <clears throat> what this means is that I'm using a version of the data set where there was at least 50% agreement between the labelers on each example. 
Uh, also, in the interest of time, uh, we're not going to train the full uh, pre-trained language model, the BERT language model, inside of this uh, example. So I'm actually going to start from the already pre-trained one. So I'm going to create a data repository and upload that pre-trained model here. Now, while I'm uploading that, I'm actually going to bounce over and talk a, a little bit more about uh, how data repositories work in Pachyderm. So data repositories are similar to Git repositories in that they store data as commits. So this means I can upload a file, and if I ever overwrite it or delete it, I can go back to the previous snapshot of that data repository. <clears throat> however, unlike, uh, however, unlike Git and most other versioning systems based on it, Pachyderm is actually specifically built for file storage. So this means that it can be used to track and version text, data, images, audio, models, pretty much anything that can be treated as a file, you can treat that uh, as, or you can put that in a data repository and version it. <clears throat> So now that my model is uploaded, I can click into that and see uh, all the different files that are associated with my model. So the config, the tokenizer, configuration, and those types of things. And uh, I'm actually going to set up one more data repository before we kick off a pipeline to connect to that. And this is going to be my labeled data repository. So this labeled data repository is a placeholder for when I bring, uh, I bring text from or predictions from the, uh, the Selden environment back into our Pachyderm environment. So I'm just going to create an empty commit here, uh, just start commit and in commit. Um, so nothing's actually being committed, but it uh, there will at least be a branch associated with it that we'll put data into later. So the next thing that I can do is I can actually deploy a Pachyderm pipeline. And so we're going to use uh, a similar type of command here where we're doing pack control create pipeline and then passing it a JSON file, which is our pipeline definition. So I'm going to deploy that, and then I'm also going to deploy another pipeline, which is my train model pipeline. And I'm deploying these, so uh, we'll see why in a second. But this should start uh, looking like the diagram that we, we previously had um, over here for the flow of our information. So once I deploy that, that pipeline, it's going to allocate a GPU for my training task. Uh, so that's, that's why I want to deploy it early. But let's first take a look at uh, what is actually contained inside of a Pachyderm pipeline to understand how it works. <clears throat> so inside a pipeline, this is just a JSON definition, or you can also use YAML definitions for them. <clears throat> but our pipeline has a name. In this case, it's going to be our data set pipeline, which is going to be responsible for taking our two sources of data, so our financial phrase bank, our, our pre-labeled data set, and then newly labeled data that will come in later on. And then it's going to organize this into training, testing, and split uh, and validation splits. <clears throat> and so what's actually happening inside of this pipeline when it runs is it's going to pull a Docker image where I've packaged up this code. It's then going to run this code on my data. And so how my data actually gets in here is through the pipeline definition inputs. So for example, in this, in this pipeline, my data set pipeline here, I have two inputs. I have my labeled data, and then I also have my financial phrase bank data. And so what's actually going to happen is Pachyderm is going to take these, these data sets, or the, these data repositories, rather, and it's actually going to map them into the pipeline under PFS, which is Pachyderm file system, and all my files will actually be accessible there. Then furthermore, it's going to create a uh, new data repository for that pipeline. And anything that I put inside of PFS out, Pachyderm file system out, will actually be, uh, once the pipeline is ended, it will commit all that data to the data set repository on the output. So I can see here, actually, that my pipeline recognized that there were some inputs available. It ran the pipeline, and then it output my training, testing, and validation splits. So I can see that there are three data files. I have one commit, and then I have one branch, which is uh, my master branch here. And so this is there's one more thing I want to mention on this, but we won't go too deep uh, on how these pipelines work, is that they can actually map in data in different ways. And, that's how, and you could actually use these glob patterns to do that. So glob patterns are actually able to tell you how to split your data. Um, so when data is committed, it can split it and run uh, pipelines in parallel to process your data without actually having to write any extra code. And I've used this plenty of times for cleaning and pre-processing data. It's, it's an amazing utility uh, so that I don't have to worry about how I'm going to multi-process and scale my, my code across a cluster. 
So one thing I also want to mention is uh, notice that I just created these pipelines and these commands here. I didn't actually ever tell them to run. So this is actually a really amazing thing about Packeter and pipelines is that they're data driven. So this means that any changes in the data repositories are actually what control the processing flow. So if I start, if I uh, commit some more data here, then it's actually going to tell the data sets uh, pipeline that it is out of date and it needs to process its new data and will automatically rerun without me having to go and actually execute a job. So let's say, for example, uh, I have my current version of the financial phrase bank here, which is the 50% agree. And let's say that uh, I'm, I want to tag this version. This is just, a, I'm just going to treat it as a branch to make it easier to reference here in a minute. Um, so I'm going to tag that as my as version one of my data set. But now what I want to do is I want to start a new commit. And I actually want to delete the, the current version of the financial phrase bank that I have. So my 50% agree. And then I also want to put a new version, which is where all of the, the uh, labelers agree. So maybe I've noticed that in my train model, the output file actually doesn't have, um, have the data set that I... Uh, or sorry, doesn't have the accuracy that I actually want. Uh, so I want to um, improve the quality of my data. So therefore, I'm actually going to delete that old version of the data set. I can actually go back to the financial phrase bank, and I may have to refresh here real quickly. But I can go back to the, the financial phrase bank after I've committed this data and see that I, have, <clears throat> I now have the version of my data set where all my sentences agree. And then... I can also go back to previous commits and see I still have access to where 50% agree. And then similarly, um, I can see that my data set pipeline without rerunning anything or without manually rerunning anything has already updated and run the task and has given me uh, as an output the new version of my training, testing, and validation sets. But I can always revert back to the previous version. So this is one of the amazing things uh, about Pachyderm is it, it can recognize changes to a pipeline's input and then automatically kick off uh, new training jobs or even new data set curation jobs. One other thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to create, uh, I'm actually going to tag my current branch of the financial phrase bank again. And I can actually look at the difference between commits as well. So I can actually do the diff of uh, financial phrase bank version one and version two and actually see all the difference, differences here. And there are better ways that, that we can potentially do this, but we have the capability of, of comparing these files across commits. And then one last thing before we, we package our trained model up and hand it over to Bruce, is uh, we can also look at anything that a data commit has done throughout the entire uh, pipeline of the entire directed acyclic graph of computation inside of Pachyderm. So if I do this flush commit command, uh, for version one of my data set, I can actually, I'll get a lot of output here, but essentially what I can see is that, uh, okay, this, this version of the financial phrase bank and labeled data had come together and that was eventually what was, uh, what was tagged for this version of the model. So with anything that happens, I can always go back in time and figure out which, which pieces of data uh, impacted something in either a positive or a negative way. So this is amazing because it gives you ironclad reproducibility and lineage for anything that is put into Pachyderm. So this ensures that you never lose anything and you also know how everything is connected. So then the next thing that I would do, and we've already prepackaged this just because it takes a minute to build, a, build the Docker image, is we can download our model, run a few commands to package it and then into a Docker container, and then we can have it be de deployed into Selden. And I'll actually stop sharing now and hand it over to Bruce to show you what this process looks like. Hey, Jimmy. So just for a reminder, can you see my screen okay, Jimmy? We have pachyderms on the left-hand side, Selden's on the right-hand side. And we're going to move over to Selden Deploy. So this is the main UI for Selden Deploy. The first thing you'll notice is that on the right-hand side, we have our namespaces. And in those namespaces, you can see the branching icon. That means that namespace is GitOps enabled. And so everything that you do from a deployment perspective within Selden for deploying your model is synced up to our GitHub account, our GitHub account for this example, for your GitHub account for your environment. And so if your engineers come along and use that Terraform finger of doom or 
what have you, and wipe out your environment in the cloud, then you can rebuild that environment and you can restore very easily the seldom deployment. So Jamie's provided me with a link to that model. Let's go ahead and talk about how we deploy that in Selden. And so I'm gonna give this a name of market sentiment. And I'm gonna deploy that into the namespace dev. I have the option of a Selden deployment using Selden core or the inference service using KF serving. Selden is a significant contributor to open source projects for both. Uh, KF serving would be if I wanted to spin instances to zero or some other use cases. Uh, in this case, we're going to use Selden. And then for our protocol, we support Selden, TensorFlow, and KF Serving. And then I'll select Next. And I'll say this a couple of times, but everything you see here, the deployment process is available also through our API and our SDK. We have prepackaged model runtimes. So if you just bring your train model artifact, we can use TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, MLflow, or Triton with any of those flavors. Uh, you just give us the train model artifact, we'll wrap it and deploy it out into the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, in Jimmy's case, he's created a custom Python model and he's created a Docker image out of it. So we're just gonna point to his Docker repository. Uh, I could give the model a name. I could use an IAM service account. It's part of our enterprise integration with deploy. And I'll hit next. Here we have um, our screen that talks about model logging. So we, on that configure button so you can expose a little bit of that. We stand up an elastic stack within Selden Deploy in your environment, and you have the ability to log all model uh, requests and responses. If you only wanted requests or you only wanted responses, depending on your use case, you could do that. If you wanted to point to your own elastic cluster, you could also specify that here or through the API. We also give the ability to set predictor parameters and environmental variables. I'm gonna leave those as default. We have predictor resource limits. So I can set the CPU, GPU, and memory resource limits for a model. And we can enable horizontal pod auto scaling within Kubernetes. So in the real world, you would probably have a reverse of this, but for my example, I'm gonna leave this at 10% CPU utilization. And then we have an input and output transformers. So you can specify images that you use for your model uh, for input and output transformer per model. And then because this is GitOps enabled, oh, ever, good job, Jimmy, greatest model ever. I get my output file for my deployment. And when I select launch, it's gonna launch that into, uh, into Selden. And then, and then we have the entire model is synchronizing and it's going to synchronize to GitHub. And then it's gonna begin to deploy the model within the platform. And you see over here on the left-hand side, we have dashboard, we have predictions, so we can actually make a prediction against the model. Um, I have requests. I can see the requests that have gone through the model. I can see, monitor the statistics on the model. I can look at the Kubernetes resources that are being deployed. I can deploy batch jobs. We can add a canary. We can add a shadow deployment. And through those, um, we also support on the API, A-B testing, multi-armed bandits, and complex inference graphs. And so I'm going to go ahead and look at a model that we do have in production just for time purposes because um, it's a, about a five gig model. And I'm going to make a request to the model. And I'll make that prediction by pasting that JSON text in. And so I'm making a live prediction to the model. We've logged that prediction to Elastic. And I can also see in my Kubernetes resources, I can just have someone go in and I wanna look at the logs from the pod. I can click those myself. I don't need to go to the DevOps team. I don't need to open a ticket. Uh, as a citizen data scientist, I can just do that self-service. So what we've done is we've taken building the model uh, and deploying that model from potentially weeks, months to uh, two hours in a real world organization between preparing and, and deploying that model. And so now that I've made those requests, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm gonna send that back over to Jimmy. Great, thank you, Bruce. All right. So while Bruce was doing that, I deployed one other pipeline, which is this raw data pipeline. And essentially what this raw data pipeline is, is it's actually uh, just pulling our um, 
the Elasticsearch logs from the Selden deployment. And what it's, what it's going to do is it's actually going to pull those into this raw data repository. I have the, the commit that it pulled them in right here. And what we can actually do is using an open source tool called Label Studio, uh, we can actually load our data from Pachyderm into this labeling environment and also have it stored right back to it. So we're going to be pulling from this raw data, and then we're actually going to be pushing it to uh, our, our target cloud storage, which is master, our master branch of our labeled data. And so we actually have another integration webinar that talks about this and how uh, the Pachyderm S3 gateway works, where you can actually treat Pachyderm as essentially just an S3 backend as a substitute. And you actually get your uh, your versioning for free by doing that. And you can reference your your data just as it as, as if it existed in buckets right there. So there's some really cool things that we can do there. But uh, so my data has been pulled from my, my raw data source. And if I go to my market sentiment data, or this is my market sentiment project in Label Studio, um, give it just a second to load here. And I can see, OK, great. I've got uh, the example that, that Bruce had put through it. And maybe I read this example and I think, oh, OK, this is it's a negative reading, but this isn't necessarily a negative sentiment. This is just more of a neutral, uh, a neutral sentiment in general. Um, and we can disagree on that and everything else. But for the purposes of the demo, uh, I'm going to label it as that. And then I'm going to click Update. <clears throat> and what's going to happen is it's going to grab this value. Uh, and then it's actually going to take it and it's going to upload it or push it via the S3 gateway into my labeled data inside of Pachyderm. So I can see uh, this is great. I now have uh, my, my new example here that has been pulled from Selden all the way into Pachyderm, or all the way into Pachyderm has been labeled. And then now we actually have this value or have this uh, example that we can incorporate with our neutral tag on it. And then actually, I don't really have to do anything else. Everything else is pretty much uh, just automated from here. So I can go to my data set and I can see that, um, OK, I had a job run just a few seconds ago. So it has curated the newest version of my data set. Uh, and this is, as I can see, I have three commits now with uh, my train test and validation sets here. Um, I won't go into them. Obviously, it's not a significant change since we only added one example. But uh, you can actually set limits on pipelines and run uh, run a, a data set curation job once a day or when there's X megabytes or gigabytes of new data available um, so that you can, you can kind of limit the number of times that you're running these operations. And so this is also going to kick off a new job. Uh, so it looks like it's, it's running now. So um, it may take a second to actually retrain this model. But uh, we've actually packaged up uh, the newest model. And then I'm actually going to hand it back over to Bruce to show us how a, uh, a Canary deployment works. Yeah, thank you very much. So now we've gone back over the fence over to Selden. <laughs> and so we're going to create the Canary model. So the two types of models, uh, three types of models we support within Selden Deploys UI is the default model, a canary, and a shadow model. And again, through our API, we support more complex inference graphs, we support routers, we support A-B testing, and multi arm bandits. So I'm going to add a canary. And again, these are our prepackaged model runtimes. We're selecting a custom model runtime. And that image is now 0.7. I can give it a name and a service account, just like I did last time. But now we have this traffic percentage split. So I'm going to assign 30% of the traffic that comes into the model to the canary and 70% to the default model. And again, I have all the same options for deploying my model. I could enable auto scaling, horizontal auto scaling for the model. Input output transformers, comments, fly, bird, fly. This one's going to be the best. And then I have my output for my deployment. I hit launch. And now my canary is deploying. And so it's going to shift in the UI, and it's going to show that 70% uh, of the traffic is going to go to the default model. 30% will go to the canary model. And if I switch over to my production namespace where we have that deployed, what we'll see is, remember, we're still over here on the right side in the seldom deploy land. And I've got my market sentiment model with the canary already deployed. In this one, I did a 10% split, but I can look at the resources for the pods that have been deployed within Kubernetes under self and deploy. I can look at both the default model and the canary model. And I can look at model accuracy. I can look at metrics for the model um, that have come through. 
I can also look, these are just Prometheus metrics related to model accuracy, real-time model precision, real-time model recall, model specificity. I can go back to the dashboard. I can see some more performance metrics about requests. I can see the live requests that are coming through in either 15 minute or 30 minute windows. I can see requests per second and average latency. And I can look at some of the, the more infrastructure related items like uh, CPU and memory utilization for the default model and for the canary model that's been deployed. And so now let's say I wanted to, because we're GitOps enabled, let's say we decided that that canary um, was, uh, that was deployed, we need to go back to that default model deployment. Everything that's been deployed within Selden is GitOps enabled and is synced to the GitHub account. So we can go back and say, you know, I want to restore the state of my model deployment to that original state. Let's say there was some other uh, deleterious effect of that model being deployed. So we want to go back and restore to our current, the original state. I can just click that easy button and say back to basics. And I can click on confirm and that's going to revert my deployment back to the default state that it was in before. So everything that I've done within Selden Deploy has been self-service. I haven't had to go, you know, if I was a citizen data scientist, I could test out my models. I could test out the um, results and the performance of my models. If I wanted to, I could also go back to my dashboard. I could create model explainers, outlier detectors, drift detectors, and do explainability on the models that I have deployed. And with that, I will go ahead and send back over, over to Jimmy. Great, thank you, Bruce. Mm -hmm. uh, could we bring up the, the slides one more time? All right, thank you, Nick. So uh, we went through a lot today. So I wanna, I wanna zoom back out and kind of recap uh, on everything that we've done. So we've seen that overall, in order for us to build machine learning models that are truly useful in the real world, we need to move data to the center of our workflow. And this means that we need to be able to train re reproducible models get them into production, and then improve them using the understanding that we've gained from monitoring them in the real world so that we can apply what we've learned. In this demo, we saw how we can go from Pachyderm as the data versioning and processing foundation for development, how we can train models with it, and then with, with Selden deploy our models, see how they do in production, incorporate those learnings back into Pachyderm because our data, our data sets and our pipelines are versioned, and then iterate on them to produce new models and then push those into production as well and go through this iterate this iterative cycle. So hopefully we've shown you how you can do this with Pachyderm as the data processing and versioning uh, foundation for development and Selden as this reliable deployment and monitoring for, uh, for updating your production models and seeing how they're doing in production. So with that, uh, I'll say thank you so much for attending. I think we're now gonna move to some Q&A. So make sure to check out the code for this example on GitHub and reach out to us to find out how you can automate your machine learning workflows so you can spend, I don't know, less time in front of your computer screen and more time at the beach and some restrictions may apply still on that. So, uh, so yeah, let's move to some Q&A. All right, um, great job guys. Uh, Lots of questions, lots of really good stuff coming from the community. I will go ahead and say, uh, keep it coming. Really good stuff. So uh, I just want to go ahead and get through it. Um, first one, we'll start with the one with the most votes is, uh, <clears throat> how does Pachyderm handle data that's located in the database? Do you need to make a row per table? And can you update Pachyderm automatically when data is in the DB is changing? Yeah, this is a really good question. So. So Pachyderm actually um, exists, I guess, slightly outside of, uh, I guess, your existing database. So ultimately under the hood, it's it's using a key value store, kind of like uh, S3 or Google Cloud Storage um, as its backend or Minio in, a, in an enterprise deployment, in a, well, I guess an on-prem deployment. So um, so it's, it's a good question. Basically what we, a repo is uh, sort of a Pachyderm abstraction on top of that. But we do have ways where you can actually connect two databases so that anytime something has updated in your database, we can pull that from the database. It's kind of like an ETL adapter, I guess, if you will, to pull from your database. And then you can store that in a data repository in Pachyderm if you're wanting to iterate on that data there. 
So that way you're not actually reliant on your database as the source of truth, because a lot of times a database can be sort of an in-flight. It's not uh, it's not ironclad reproducibility there because values can change. Um, so we we would uh, we would probably recommend that pulling out of, pulling it out of that and then treating it in uh, the object storage or like the underlying object storage that happens in Pachyderm. Um, so similar to what I did with Elasticsearch uh, with that pipeline, that that uh, cron pipeline, it's pulling on some regular cadence so I can back up my data inside of Pachyderm. All right. Um, all right, this one comes from Dan Barber. Do you have the ability to control execution based on multiple data set updates? For example, I may want to make sure I update labeled data and a phrase bank before running again. So th there's definitely some things that you can control there. Um, we, in the interest of automating some of this stuff, I, there might be a question around, can I, can I basically just retrain uh, when I, as a human, decide I want to? And there are definitely some ways to do that, which is essentially creating a, um, a data repository where there's a, a human, if you will, commit to that data repository. And then that actually is... Uh, is what's triggering the the actual training. So there are some ways that you can structure that, but um, yeah, th there's there's plenty of ways um, so that you can actually organize the cadence in which these pipelines run. You can have it be based on anytime there's a new example, anytime any of the data uh, is changed at all, or when uh, the change is you know 50 commits uh, or uh, even even. Uh, like, like I said, at the megabyte or the gigabyte level or something like that. So there, there's a few different types of limits. I'm probably forgetting some off the top of my head right now. But um, yeah, there, there's a lot of ways that you can you can organize that to make it, uh, to, to control the execution of when you want something to rerun. All right, uh, Bruce, I think this one's for you. Does Selden support both push integration or just pull model for the deployment? Thinking from yeah. a dev cycle perspective. Yeah, that's a great question. So most customers, what they start out with is going through the UI, building the models, experimenting. They're able to give the UI to citizen data scientists uh, for them to go through and and create their create the deployments for their models, go through experimentation. But really, when it gets into an enterprise production grade, they're using our API. And so they're calling out to deploy their models um, strictly through code and fitting into their software development life cycle. I'll add one more thing in there. And uh, this is actually something we've worked on in, uh, in a different um, context or experiment, but we have looked at doing some integrations between uh, Pachyderm being able to push a deployment directly to Selden. Um, so you, to, using the Selden API to do that. Um, so, so definitely check out some of our examples. And I believe we're working on another one right now that We'll, we'll be out at, at some point in the near future that will show some of those things too. Nick, are you still there? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Here's the next question, sorry. Uh, how does Packetum store the data? Does it treat it similar to how Git does plain text to reduce space by keeping track of the commits and the diff on one data set? One of the biggest costs we see entering is data storage costs. If each data set version is a complete copy, that can get expensive. This is a really, really good question. And uh, to, to provide a, a robust answer here, we will actually have a, a blog post coming out very soon on this exact topic. Um, so. Uh, we'll, we'll take note of your name and hopefully send you a link to it when it comes out, but you're exactly right. So essentially all data versioning platforms uh, are, get included. You're either tracking, you're either snapshotting or you're tracking the diffs between, uh, between snapshots. And there's, there's some hybrid there that gives you the, the best balance of, uh, you're essentially trading off uh, disk space for, um, for processing power. So if you, if you want to reconstruct an, uh, something from just the original snapshot, then you have to apply all the diffs that have happened between the original snapshot and now. Or on the flip side, if you snapshot everything, then you have a lot that you're saving to disk. So there, there's definitely a balance here. And Pachyderm is actually really, really, uh, the, the engineers are really intelligent in how they've created it to uh, actually give you some flexibility around how you balance those things. So there are some tweaks that if, if you're optimizing for a particular criteria, 
um, there, there are definitely ways to optimize things like, uh, it, it's called the chunk size and a couple of other things that go into that. Um, so without going into too much detail, uh, we, we absolutely think about, think about this. This is top of mind when we're actually, or when the core developers are working on Pachyderm and it's, it's a very good thing to keep in mind, but yes, it, it's absolutely something that, that we, we, uh, keep our finger on the pulse on. Awesome. All right. Just a couple more. Um, we've got one here from Otto. Do you think it's possible to integrate Kubeflow along uh, with Pachyderm or are they mutually exclusive? Yeah. So they're definitely not mutually exclusive. Uh, we've actually done um, something called KF data, which might be something to check out to show how we can actually use Pachyderm essentially as this, this data layer uh, where you're getting your version data and then um, essentially setting up this notification system of new data is available to use Kubeflow pipelines. Uh, there's been some early work on it and it's been in, uh, and I, I think there's been some proof of concepts and even some details around how those things can work together. So they absolutely can integrate. Um, obviously there's some benefits of Kubeflow pipelines and there's some benefits to Pachyderm pipelines. So uh, it, it kind of depends on the use case in a lot of those scenarios, but yes, it, they're, they're definitely not mutually exclusive. They, they can absolutely work together. Awesome. All right. Here's, uh, let me go and I got one more question, but I just want to check the chat really quick to make sure I'm answering all of these questions. Okay. A couple, uh, do we comply with data privacy standards like HIPAA, uh, uh, sign, a BAA? So we, uh, the current, um, the current version of Pachyderm Hub does not currently, uh, but we are looking into some of those certifications and then an on-prem deployments, um, I'll have to check on the status of uh, at least uh, BAA. Uh, I believe we have we have some level of the ability to comply, but I don't know if it's right out of the box is is HIPAA compliant. Yeah, HIPAA compliance is always a good thing to reach out to us about. I mean, it really depends on how I think you have it deployed, and and yeah, that's uh, great. Pachyderm really inherits a lot of its compliance context from where it's deployed, so. Um, it's always a tricky way to answer that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're more than happy to explore that with you. Uh, our Slack channel is a great place to ask questions or we have an excellent team of experts waiting uh, to help you guys. Let me check a couple more. Ah, okay, so I've, had, I've seen this one cup, uh, come up a couple times. Yes, this webinar is going to be recorded and it will be made available to everyone who's registered uh, and you'll be able to play it on demand. So if you weren't able to follow along with the code today or, or kind of like you were looking at Jimmy's example and um, want to just maybe dive into things a little bit more, um, you're absolutely able to do that. Hub is going to, Packerm Hub is going to give you a cluster. So it's really no fuss. You can just literally deploy a cluster. Uh, deploy this NLP pipeline, take a look at um, how, you know, and kind of follow along with this webinar and go back and see what Jimmy was doing and and deploy Selden alongside of that. And once you get your model, you can take that and deploy it with Selden and and, and kind of practice this handoff. And I think it's a great way for um, anyone to kind of continue to give this stuff a shot or continue to try it out. I'm going to go ahead and just make sure I've got all these questions. Okay, one more question is, uh, this is awesome. General question. I've been following Pachyderm for a while. What do you call the role for something like this? I've been an enterprise developer for five years, and now I have a master focusing in ML. I want to bring these two worlds together. What would be considered, uh, would it be considered a data scientist or more of an ML dev op engineer? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to take this one. It, it, it's... Uh... I've led a few different teams and I've had a hard time figuring out what the, the what the position should even be called. Um, it, it's, it's really tough. I, I actually would, uh, I think there's a lot of like ML ops engineer gets thrown out there. I probably tend more to be on the, on the research engineer side myself, but um, yeah, I think, I think these terms are always moving data scientist at one organization may, may mean something completely different at a different organization. Um, and this ML DevOps engineer, uh, it, it kind of all depends on the company and, and what people are working on. So I, I think there's probably um, maybe room for an ML DevOps engineer in this realm. Uh, in general, like we're, we're just seeing that more and more people need to know a little bit about a lot of things to be able to, uh, to really uh, apply their expertise appropriately. Mm -hmm.